um, helping programmers with parallelism. And specifically, I'm going to talk about what we're doing with our Parallel Studio project. But um, much of what I talk about is also available uh, from Intel uh, on Linux machines and some of it on, on Mac OS X. But I'm going to focus on, on Parallel Studio today but hopefully give you some idea of the motivations of what we're trying to do, the problems we're trying to solve, and where we think this is taking us. Um, I also plan to leave time at the end for questions, but if there's a question um, as we're going through it, something I can clarify, go ahead and interrupt me and ask. Uh, I'll be happy to do my best to answer. So I'm going to start by talking about two things that I think we need for parallelism, kind of divide the talk up uh, among these two things, um, and then specifically talk about Parallel Studio and then have a demo of some of the capabilities we have. So in a sense, what we need for parallelism is two things. One, one the very popular, what language extensions are we going to get, or what sort of libraries, you know, this is the really cool thing to talk about. What keywords should I add to the language, or what new programming language should I adopt? But that's not really the full picture. It's incredibly hard to get a program working if you have a cool language but you have no tools to support you. This, this applies to sequential programming or parallel. So I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing in parallel tools, what some of the issues are there in tooling to help you write a parallel program effectively. Um, so I think I spend some of the time, half the time, talking about you know, what new cool features, languages, things like that we might invest in. but then talk about the tools that need to bring that home for us. So if we look today at the things that um, are supported to help us with parallelism that have emerged as um, widely used, first of all, there are some libraries. Um, in particular, our Intel integrated performance primitives are pretty popular at helping build some things like audio and video codecs, uh, multimedia, um, also not mentioned here is we have a math library. Um, that's not so much in our target audience for um, uh, parallelism, mainstream parallelism, as it is maybe more in workstations and HPC. But you see libraries, threaded libraries. I, I like to say if you can get someone else to do the work for you, go ahead. So if someone's written a library, it's threaded, can take advantage of multi-core, uh, let's go for it. The other thing is we could hope that the compiler could do some things automatically for us. I would not expect a lot out of this, but I will also tell you that I think Intel's compiler is the best at auto-parallelization of any compiler um, that exists. It can look at code and determine sometimes that it can run it in parallel loops and, and so forth without you giving it any hints. You just tell the compiler you want it to try doing that. Certain types of code parallelize really well and almost everything else does not. Um, so you, you're not likely to get huge benefits from this, but if you have certain type of loopy code, um, this, is, this is a very real option. It works really well for some people, um, but it's never the complete story. So I almost worry about even mentioning it. But when you have the, the, compiler that, the compilers that are best at doing it in the world, it's worth mentioning, but it's also um, worth taking them out for a spin and finding out that it won't cure everything. So if we take a look, the, the logical things we want to look at next are how could we expand the languages? If we're doing libraries, um, that, that's limited to domains. If we're doing automatic compiler parallelization, that's limited. Um, the next logical thing to be thinking about is how could we extend the languages? So um, about 13 years ago, 14 years ago, the specification for OpenMP came out. And this extends C and Fortran um, for parallelism. And in its current version now, 3.0 specification, it's able to help with task and data parallelism. Um, it's, it's worth looking at. It's probably better geared for scientific applications than it is for uh, programming outside of the scientific domain. So then we have Intel threading building blocks. And this, this is a very good option for C and C++ programmers. Um, it's we, something that Intel created. It's available open source. It's available supported through our um, Intel compilers, libraries. So it's been ported all over the place. There's an Xbox 360 port. There's ports to Solaris, ports to 
uh, AIX, the Spark processor supported PowerPC, of course, uh, Intel processors, AMD processors. It's, it's very widely um, used. It started with a really simple question. What does C++ need added to it to support parallelism? And, the, and this has turned out to be um, a very popular thing. Just, uh, just a few weeks ago, I think, Epic announced that they're using it in their Unreal Engine and shipping it um, along with Unreal so that they can promote people writing plugins of using threading building blocks. And that's just one of quite a number of uh, companies that have been promoting the use of threading building blocks as their solution for parallelism. Um, I hear there's a really great book available on it. And some of you get the joke because I wrote the book. Um, I was, uh, Intel was kind enough to, to uh, donate a few of these that we can give out um, to interested people later. Um, if you ask good questions, if you're still awake at the end of the talk. Um, but uh, some of you dropped up ahead of time to tell me that you enjoyed the book, and I really do appreciate feedback like that. It sometimes makes me blush a little bit, but it's, it's a joy of a project to work on because it's really turned out to help people a lot. But we're not done. Threading building blocks is really kind of a, a great solution to solve um, C++, C parallel programming um, in general. Uh, you may have heard that um, this summer we got busy. We had a couple of teams join us. We, we ended up acquiring a couple of teams. One was a company called Silk Arts. The engineering team there joined us. They were working on a project, a language extension called C++ or Silk++. Also a company up in Waterloo called Rapid Mind. We, uh, they joined us. Um, Waterloo, Ontario to work on our CT project. Um, so we're making some additional investments. So Silk++, I'll show you some of the keywords in a little bit here, but it is um, very similar to threading building blocks. It solves some of the same, it solves the same problems. I'll show a, a diagram of why I think it solves the same problems. But we're going to take a little different tact. Is if you could add keywords to a language, how far could you take that? I think this is going to be a long road for us, but I think it would be very interesting. And hopefully about a year from now, we'll have a product that has Silk++ in it. So this foil says futures, right? Um, we are working on that. I hope to have a beta out um, from Intel early next year that would have this in it. Um, but we definitely are very serious about this. We're taking a lot of feedback. There have been a lot of people who have played around with Silk++. We still have an experimental version of it available from us um, that you can experiment with. And we're asking, you know, would a keyword model take us a little further than TBB? Um, we're likely to make it a subset and look into some guarantees we can do. But that's some exciting future. CT technology and rapid mind, we do have a class on that tomorrow. Um, I'll show some examples of, of what we're thinking about there. Concurrent collections, there's also a great class on that tomorrow. Um, if you don't know about our whatif.intel.com website, I encourage you to go there. Cool experimental things to download for parallelism and for other, on other topics for free to try out and give feedback on. And then, of course, Microsoft's got a couple of projects. I'm not doing them complete justice here. We'll talk more about them in a class tomorrow um, in their uh, Visual Studio 2010. Their concurrency runtime that we will take advantage of as well in our product, and their parallel pattern library, which is um, uh, strongly related to threading building blocks. So those are some futures. Now, sometimes I like to say we love standards. You've heard this phrase, we love standards, that's why we have so many. So what's the deal with all these pr parallel programming languages? So you know, if you come to a talk and you're going to learn something about how to do parallel programming, and the next thing you know, there's been um, 10 or 20 different parallel programming methods mentioned, um, it'd be useful if we could kind of think about these in some sane manner. Um, you know, s sequential programming, programming before multi-core, um, we have hundreds if not thousands of programming languages that have been popular. And parallelism is going to inspire the same sort of richness. So it's time to start thinking about how can we organize these. And so what, what I like to think about is there, you can use several of these methods in the same program. That's not unusual. So 
if we're talking about threading building blocks and then we're talking about um, CT technology, those, those are real obvious to me. They belong in the same program together. And then we might even have something like concurrent collections or um, use the pipeline feature out of TBB and use that in the same program. So the best model I have now to work in progress is a model that says um, at one level you may have sort of a coordinating message passing oriented control at a very high level on your program. And most programs don't have this level, um, but some do. Then you have one that's more control oriented, flow of control, threading building blocks plays into here, Silk++ does as well. Um, and that's task control, um, controlling structures. And then finally, if we look just at data parallelism, you see things like RabbitMind, CT technology, uh, arrays in the Fortran 90 standard. Um, if you're old enough to remember APL, um, you might even think of APL. So these are recurring themes. And what I would say about these is if you're doing parallel programming, you might want to understand why you might choose something out of each of these categories. Um, I think most people would start in the middle category and pick one. Um, my sense is um, data parallelism will become very popular, the, the, the bottom level I have here. Um, the top level, I, I, if, you, if, if it's useful to you in your program, you'll know, I think you'll know it. Um, but it's worth looking at each of these classes, and I don't think you would pick TBB and Silk and use them in the same program. You can, it'll work, um, but they, they're so similar you would pick one of them. But using threading building blocks and uh, CT technology in the same program is, is going to feel very natural because they're solving different ways, uh, different aspects of par programming and parallelism. So. This is hopefully a useful way to think about it a little bit and why we're um, promoting more. So you're going to see, I think, threading building blocks continues to be the most important thing we've been able to introduce and support and absorb. You're going to see a lot of energy from us put behind uh, CT technology as well. Um, and I'm pretty excited about the concurrent collections experiment that's up on what if done in telecom. I think that may prove some benefits over time. So let me talk a little about CT. And there's a class on this tomorrow. I'll have a list of the classes at the end, but I think there's a little handout in the back too with a list of all the software classes if you, if you feel like you need to carry around more handouts. But the um, CT is a data parallel focused programming extension. And what's really interesting is, is if you focus on the task of data parallelism, we think that you can offer some advantages. You can get um, uh, code that's portable, that scales forward, that can take advantage of more cores, it'll scale better in general, and that we can guarantee the, the absence of data races and deadlocks, which are often a very frustrating part of parallel programming. It, start, it, it basically has two simple concepts to CT. One is you create these data structures called VEX, to hold your data, and then you operate on them with simple operators that look like array, array notation. Um, the programs are very readable, they look very mathematical. Um, we have a deep dive talk on this tomorrow, I'll show more about it, but if you write a program like that, you can get a lot of code to work that way. Um, what you'll find is it's very portable that it can use a CPU, say with SSE 3, it can move forward and use AVX without recompiling the code. Um, it could use an attached um, GPU, an attached GPU like uh, Larabee. Um, you could even look forward to it using a hybrid processor, something that mixes um, big cores and little cores together, or big cores and uh, GPU cores. So it's worth looking at this model if you have a data parallel problem. And anyways, if we're looking forward in the future, this will be part of uh, Parallel Studio in the future. Um, CT will be in beta um, by the end of this year, um, and it's, it'll be compatible with Parallel Studio and Parallel Studio's tools. Pretty simple looking structure. Like I said, we've got a class tomorrow. We can talk more about it. In traditional C code, you write a loop, it turns out translating a loop into parallel program means the compiler is undoing something you've already written um, to get it and disperse it on a parallel processor. 
Um, CT, you don't actually even write the root loop to start with. You treat it more, um, the arrays more as natural items that you're um, making operations on. Now, SOAP++ takes a little different tack. SOAP++ is more like threading building blocks and that is trying to control um, flow of control, task-oriented aspects of your program. And instead of being built on templates, and extending the C++ language that way, it, it just says, hey, let's introduce some keywords into the language, um, something the compiler has to recognize. So this requires a specialized compiler. An interesting question to ask is if the compiler actually knows what you're doing, can it help you? I'll be real honest, we don't know yet. We have some really good ideas that it can, um, but we still have work to do. So why did we acquire and add this team to us and start, and we're investing in it? It's because we believe in the technology. We believe we can do something with it. So again, looking to the future, what if we add some keywords? And this will have to, more details on this are available. You can go to silk.com and look at the papers there and so forth and try to guess what we're going to do with it. We're still trying to figure it out, but we are looking for feedback on this as well. But so you can see we've got, um, today, we have support for libraries, OpenMP, automatic parallelization, threading building blocks, and in the future we're looking at things like Silk and CT, uh, concurrent collections, other things that will extend our uh, reach. They're all consistent with each other, but they all have share one thing in common, is they really need some good tools to back you up. So if you get these wonderful languages and write a program in them, what's going to happen to you? So, we took a look at Visual Studio and said, what can we do to help people in the Visual Studio environment? And like I said, some of what I'm going to talk about, we have support for some similar things on Linux, not quite as neatly packaged um, because of the diversity of environments on Linux, but on Windows, we have Visual Studio, how can we extend that? So we took a look and said, you know, we, we can help programmers in four areas. We can help them with the design of the program, the writing of the program and debugging that, uh, verification and tuning. And we broke down our product this way into distinct components. Um, since we started selling this at the end of May, almost all the sales have been for the whole package. It's been, uh, the feedback from users has been very clear that these, uh, all of these are useful additions to Visual Studio and people have almost universally decided they want to use all of these extensions. So, in the code and debug phase, what can we do to help here? Well, it starts with a good compiler. So we have a highly optimizing C, C++ compiler, supports OpenMP 3.0, threading building blocks, integrated performance primitives, and we have some clever debugger extensions. And so, by, by this we can um, help developers with things including auto-parallelization, optimization, 32 and 64 bits, you know, everything that you should expect out of a good compiler these days. Um, and we support uh, parts of the C++0x standard. So here's my plug for lambdas. This is kind of a fun thing to look at because as you, as you sort through all the things that got added to the C++ draft standard, you realize some of them have something to do with trying to help C++ be more ready for parallelism. And one of the ones that's really cool is something called lambda expressions. And this is an old concept from languages like Lisp. Um, can I write a little section of code and then treat it as an object? And then what could I do with that object? Well, if we had had this when we first implemented threading building blocks, threading building blocks would be a lot e easier to teach because we struggled with this. But now you can do simple things where you do a lambda function introduce it with the bracket, ampersand bracket in this case, and then have some code, and then that can get passed into something like a for statement, in this case a for each. Um, at the end I'll tell you, you can go reference these, uh, the PDFs for this talk online, and so this is gratuitously thrown in there, some examples um, to sort of illustrate um, how to dissect our lambda function information. We're pretty close to posting some more examples up on the Threading Building Blocks website that use the Lambda functions. Lambda functions are very new, but I can show you, this is um, 
This is a, a simple matrix multiplication written using threading building blocks. And the stuff in yellow is the code I really want to write. The yellow block is a loop. Not too hard. Um, triply nested loop doing the matrix multiply. And then the, the yellow line below is actually, you know, I want to call the matrix multiply and pass in two arrays and have an output array. Um, that's what I want to write. All the rest of that stuff is ugly crud. And in this particular case, without lambdas, I had to create a class definition. So this is one of those things that can drive you nuts writing code. You think, gee, I wanted to write parallel code. Why do I have to write all this extra crud? This is important, I think, when we look at tooling for parallelism, is how can we get rid of some of this stuff? So lambdas, which is a very intelligent thing with the C++ standards adding to it, um, cleans that up. And this is equivalent code. Um, there's only a tiny bit of stuff I'm written here saying parallel 4 and so on. Um, otherwise, most of my code is exactly the way I wanted to write it. This is the ugly code without lambdas. This is the useful code with it. So it doesn't escape us that a feature like lambdas in a new C++ standard can be used to make parallelism easier, even though you won't find in the standard it's not going to say lambdas were added to help you with parallel programming. So this is in our compilers, all of our release compilers now, the support for lambdas. I think you can expect to see it in virtually everybody else's compilers, you know, over the upcoming several years, I would imagine, because other compilers tend to try to keep up with the standards as well. Other things we've added, debug breakpoints. Parallelism is kind of nasty. What if you're sharing variables? Wouldn't it be nice to know when they're shared and break on when the sharing occurs? So we extend the Microsoft debugger to be able to, to uh, catch that, enable detection. Um, there's also another cool feature, which is suppress the parallelism that we've asked for and run the program in a serial mode so that we can debug it more easily. This is without recompiling. Um, I was kind of thinking about uh, Paul Adelini's talk today, and he said that we were apparently asking consumers to tweet about uh, what, they would, what, what they would like uh, in the future, things like uh, time transport machines and so on. I was thinking that's kind of what we did with our uh, Parallel Studios. We asked developers what sort of features would help you do parallel programming. And uh, this one I thought was really clever, being able to suppress the parallelism. So it basically intercepts uh, open MP activity in the program and forces it to serialize it, which can make the program easier to debug if you're scratching your head. And usually that was something you would recompile the program and then run it again in serial mode. Um, here you can do it in the debugger. That's a pretty simple extension to the Microsoft debugger that's part of Parallel Studio. So you can get that from the, you can get a compiler and debugger that helps you. Then we can get into the verification stage. And this is where I think a lot of parallel programs fall apart, is they feel less stable than a serial program. And that's because data parallelism, things like uh, data uh, races, so the parallelism, the mutual, um, mutual shared data that's uh, being changed, so mutable, um, shared data where you've got multiple threads changing the same data and using it and they don't get synchronized properly. Um, so that, um, we've had a tool that can detect race conditions and deadlock and point them out to you for some time now. We were able to package that up to be faster or easier to use. But the other thing that we have in here is um, we've got the, the best memory checking tool in the industry now in Parallel Studio. We can find memory leaks um, and other memory errors that you can make in a program here better than any other tool in the market. And that's a lot of fun because um, it turns out in a parallel program, if you have a memory error and you start running your program in parallel, it gets worse and harder to debug. And none of the memory tools on the market handle parallelism well. And we built a memory detection tool with parallelism in mind. Um, and we thought, gee, we're going to build, with parallelism in mind, we're going to build a tool that can detect memory leaks and take you back to the source code. And we're going to try to be competitive with the other memory leak tools on the market. What we ended up building was a tool that's capable of handling parallelism, and it's better than the other memory leak tools on the market. So it's well worth a try. Um, and it can take you back to the source code, show you where memory leaks. It, it handles a whole lot of different types of classic memory errors. 
Again, a fun feature because a memory leak tool, when you're trying to talk about parallel programming, why are you talking about a memory leak tool? Well, it turns out this is a class of bugs that people try to get out of their program, and it turned out there weren't any tools that could help you get those bugs out of a parallel program effectively. And so we saw some customers telling us they couldn't make the leap to parallelism because the tools that they used for memory leak detection wouldn't work on a parallel program. And they were right. And that's fixed with parallel uh, inspector. I expect, hopefully, that other people with memory leak tools will update them someday because we definitely need tooling to help us with parallelism. And this is one case. So we can go help you with the memory allocation. And then, aside from memory um, allocation errors, we can detect data races. This is the classic, most ugly parallel programming bug there is. Um, and for, at least for the majority of my career, I've always viewed it as something when you think you have a data race, you just start beating your head against the wall and keep guessing where it is, trying to isolate it, find it. And you feel really lucky the day you find it. Um, We've seen projects do parallel programming and abandon the parallel version of their projects because they couldn't find their data races or what was causing them. So this tool can find data races directly even if your program's working. Does this one work with the IPP library? Does it work with IPP? Yes. So which means that if the race happens because of IPP library, it will be detected. Yes. And if you, if, if the, if, yes. If the data race were inside IPP and you don't have the source code to it, it will resort to showing it to you in assembly language what the problem is, but yes. And if you've, if you've ever debugged a data race condition, you could be sitting in the audience now saying, well, this is a rather audacious claim, a tool that can find a data race. But the technology behind it is incredibly simple. It, you run your program and it observes all the memory accesses your program is doing. And if it sees two threads playing with the same memory, and that memory is being modified, it doesn't matter if you're both playing with the same memory and it's only, it never gets changed, but if it ever gets modified and it can't sense that there's any synchronization going on, it'll flag it as an error. What's hard, after you have this incredibly simple idea of how to solve this, is how to prune that so that you don't actually have to look at every memory access because that would be kind of slow. The tool's not fast as is, but it's not that slow. Um, and then the other thing is how do you detect what synchronization mechanisms are and how do you avoid false positives? The tool is very, very good at what it does. Um, and it's built on an incredibly simple idea. And nothing I mentioned there involved source, uh, changing the source code or recompiling it. It operates on your existing binaries. It tries not to, yes. And for classic things like uh, some, some of the mechanisms it knows about, it'll avoid them. If you do get a false positive, there's a way to describe your mechanism to the tool and get rid of it if you've created your own lock mechanisms. Um, yes. And it points it out to you in the source code, hopefully with very readable error messages. And this is an incredible tool. It has helped a lot of uh, applications get rid of data race conditions, sometimes ones they didn't know about. Um, I know even in VTune's uh, device driver, we had a data race uh, when we did some new features in it a few years ago. And we used this tool to find the data race. And, um, usually when it tells the developer that they have a data race, including me. <laughs> um, you, you first start with denial, and then you realize the tool's telling you the truth most of the time. So, um, Data races are very hard to reason out in your head sometimes, especially when they involve um, a DLL or a system call or something set up against your program. We're finding that's where people tell us they find a lot of data races, is they didn't think through the complete stack they were in, the DLLs and so on. So the fact that this doesn't require source code is really helpful because the feedback from uh, users is that a lot of the data races they find are uh, include code that they don't have the source code to. The data race isn't exclusively usually in the code they don't have source code to, but it's caused because of the interactions. 
And then, of course, after you've got your program working, you might want to tune it. And so this is, tuning a parallel program is all about how do you represent it, how do you visualize it. Um, and there's three key things that we think are important. Hotspot analysis, which you can find in a lot of profiling tools, including VTune, um, shows you where you're spending time or where um, your program's uh, doing its, most of its work. But then there's also, um, well, then you can, you can do different runs. I should, um, you can run your program in different ways and see it, how it changes where the program runs. And that can be very useful, too. You might run a serial and a parallel version after you've been working on it a while or run it on a two-core versus a four-core to look at things. But you can look at concurrency analysis. This is where we try to tell you for given threads how much are they busy versus how much are they idle and give you sign of an idea where there might be time being wasted or not utilized well. And then finally, there's locking profile, which says, you know, which locks, you're going to be using locks, so you, for synchronization, which locks are causing delays? Um, and which, you know, threads are waiting on a lock, and then we can take you to those locks and say, this lock's being waited on a lot. It's uh, reducing the efficiency of your program. So those three things are handled, and having those all in one tool is very handy as well. Now finally, you know, after, if you've got a compiler, you've got the ability to find race conditions, debug your program, tune it, those are things you classically expect. But we, we are also tackling a, a very hard problem, which is how can we help you get started? And this is not magic. You know, we, we talk, people have for a long time said, can we stare at a program? Can we write a tool that looks at a program, tells us how to add parallelism, it magically adds all the parallelism, and then uh, we don't have to do any work. Well, I don't think you can write such a thing, but if you do, you're going to get, you'll probably have a lot of users. Um, that's not what we're doing here. What we realized is that people usually start with a profiling tool and say, hey, there's a part of my program that we're spending a lot of time in. I want to make that run in parallel. But then what do you do? You prototype it. And when you prototype it, you find out you introduced the data race, or you've got a global variable, you've got scalability problems, you've got all sorts of problems, but until you code it up, you might not realize some of these issues. So we said to ourselves, what can we do to accelerate that process? Could we do a tool that would analyze what you're proposing doing and telling you what problems you might run into? And that's exactly what um, Parallel Advisor Lite does. Now this is an experimental tool available to go with Parallel Studio. It's freely downloadable to complement Parallel Studio. Um, we do expect to have an enhanced version of it next year. And Mark, Mark's going to be giving a talk on it tomorrow, um, more detailed, whole hour on Advisor. He can go into it a lot more detail than I will today. Um, it's a really interesting idea, and we're getting really good feedback that it can be quite helpful. Um, we've seen a lot of parallel development get stuck in this phase where you've got a bright idea where you want to add parallels and you add it and it doesn't work for some reason and you don't have time to debug it, investigate the lack of scaling and so on. We think we can power people through that phase of development. So, Parallel Advisor will let you know where parallelism should be used, find the candidate site, and then let you um, add some annotations and give you some feedback. And then you would finish up by adding the actual parallelism in, um, into your code. So you do some prototyping, the tool gives you feedback, and then you'll know where the best places are to add parallelism. So that's in a nutshell the whole um, uh, application cycle. And uh, Joe's going to give us a demo. All right. Yes, so. What I'm going to do here is uh, try to walk through uh, on a real application uh, the use of Parallel Studio and show you many of the steps and the tools that James was just talking about. And what I have open here, well first, the application I'm going to use is this uh, Tachyon ray trace rendering application. It's an open source application. You can find online, just search for Tachyon. There's also a version of it similar to what I'm doing here available as, a, as part of the TVB samples. What I have here on my laptop, this is a dual core laptop, uh, is Visual, Microsoft Visual Studio 2008. 
and I have parallel studio installed. I've got the uh, parallel advisor light toolbar up here, uh, composers, parallel debugger extensions toolbar, uh, a toolbar for switching back and forth between Microsoft and Intel C++ compiler projects, and then inspectors uh, toolbar for threading and memory errors. Okay, the when you in the solution that I have here, you can see in the Solution Explorer, I've got a number of different projects under one solution. Um, and they're all already converted to use Parallel Composer. You can see by the, the pretty composer icon there. So, you know, the question is, of course, how do I get started? And if, uh, if I had more time, I would show you exactly how to use Parallel Advisor Lite to help me find the hotspot and then do the you know, performance modeling and the correctness modeling that James was talking, talking about. But in the interest of time here, I'm just going to go ahead and skip right to the, the actual hotspot that it pointed me to, and I'll let Mark Davis uh, give you the full demo of it tomorrow. Um, so unfortunately, we can't go through all that right now. But here is the hotspot that, that we want to focus on from presentation. We have this uh, draw trace routine that is driving everything. You can see in the outer loop here, it's computing the drawing area. And then in the inner loop, it's rendering one pixel at a time. So you could probably imagine this is where you know, a lot of the performance is going to be going through. Now the question is, how do I actually implement performance or parallelism? And with Parallel Composer, you know, as James said, we have a number of options. I could use uh, OpenMP um, and just implement a simple you know, OpenMP Parallel 4 Pragma. I could use uh, TBB doing something similar. I could use the OpenMP's task construct from OpenMP 3.0 and try to task the entire function call. Um, but since I happen to know OpenMP fairly well myself, I went ahead and just decided to do a pretty prototype with OpenMP and just insert this OpenMP Parallel 4, which says I'm going to create a parallel region out of this for loop and then let the OpenMP runtime create the, uh, the team of threads as necessary and schedule the work amongst them. So let me go ahead and try that and see. Oh, but actually, first I forgot to show you the application running. We need to get a, um, uh, a performance baseline to begin. And so this is the serial version. You can see it's just it's a pretty complex image. It's rendering. And it takes 12.3 seconds. OK, so that's our uh, serial baseline. Now, let me go ahead and run my uh, quick and dirty OpenMP prototype. And I've already compiled all of these beforehand, so we don't have to watch the compiler do its thing. Um, and so you, you can see in the OpenMP implementation, it implemented it in, in at least two threads, and we got a pretty significant speed up. We went down to 7.1 seconds, so you know, not bad. But let me run that again. If you look closely at the image, can you catch the results or something? Yeah, exactly. So you can see all these blue spots appearing. Yeah, you can see them up here. These are pixels that either got incorrectly rendered or missed during the rendering. So somehow, in my uh, in my parallel implementation, um, I've done something wrong. So my quick and dirty solution ended up being dirty. Uh, and so. You know, this, this can be the frustrating thing or the challenging thing with, uh, with parallelism or going into threading. Is you can end up with these very subtle errors like James was talking about that can be caused by you know, data race conditions or, or some memory uh, access races uh, that can be very frustrating to find. But what I'm going to do with Parallel Studio here is go ahead and let Parallel Inspector try to find, try to you know, help me pinpoint some errors. So I'm going to pull it up and just ask it to detect both data lock, deadlocks and data races. And I'll just run that. Let me move some windows out of the way here. Now, what Inspector is going to be doing is analyzing every memory access um, through that it sees during the, during the run of this application. And you can actually see, even before we started drawing anything, it's already found some error conditions. So I'm going to go ahead and stop that. And let it uh, 
uh, collect the results here. But it's inspecting all of the memory accesses that, that's going on underneath it, underneath this application as well as system uh, resources that, that your application might be touching. And so it's, it gets a very clear and broad picture of all the, of all the issues. But what it's done here is boil all of those events down to really just two key problems. It prioritizes all the problem sets that it identifies, and then for each problem set, it reports some observations. So in the case of this, this first one, it says I've got you know, different threads reading that memory location and writing to the same location. And I can double click on one of those, and it goes right into the source and shows me exactly what the problem was. So in this particular case, I had a uh, one thread writing to this same box object, and then another thread writing to the same object. So very clearly a, a data race right there. I'll go back and look at this other one, double click again, and here, uh, again, I've got two writes from multiple threads to the same, to the same memory object, the same variable. So, you know, quite quickly, even though I didn't even let the inspector um, inspect the entire application, it's already identified you know, two you know, very clear data race conditions that are you know, going to impact my execution. So with that, let's go back and look at the source code. And really what's going on, here's that inbox variable that it was talking about. There's a serial variable. You know, what's really happened in my quick and dirty solution is these variables are declared outside of the parallel region, and thus they end up being global to you know, all the things that are created. Um, so I either need to create some critical sections around all the accesses to those variables, or I need to create you know, perhaps private copies of each of those variables to each of the threads. And so I can do that pretty easily with OpenMP um, as an example here, and I'll just use this first private clause and, and that just says, tells the OpenMP runtime to, in the compiler, uh, create a private copy of each of those variables to each of the threads. And then by using first private, it means initialize each of those objects to whatever values they had at the time of this, at the time of this call. Okay, so let's just see if that, if that fixes my problem here. And there we go. That looks much cleaner. I don't see any of those uh, missing pixels. All right, so that seems to be working okay now. Um, yeah, but 7.2 seconds, you know, we started at 12.3 seconds, so we're at about a 1.6, 1.7x speed up. I, I'm greedy. I want to get a little bit more than that. And so the next step in the process is to look for, is to do some tuning. So I'm going to go ahead and use parallel amplifiers concurrency analysis. So look at how to look for concurrency, and I'll fire up a profiler. Now amplifier runs the application with very little overhead. Um, it's just analyzing where uh, time is being spent. And let's look at the report that it shows me. So it just takes a second here. So where is my concurrency pool? All right, the, um, let me sort this in terms of uh, uh, descending time here. Okay, it, what it's pointing out to me is that, and first of all, this grid intersect and sphere intersect, these are um, the, the biggest time takers in here. And if I look at, you know, say, grid intersect, I can see it's in the call chain of my draw trace routine. So I'm, I know I'm looking in the right place. Uh, but the, the CPU utilization column here is telling us you know, where our CPU utilization is poor, and I don't see any in there indicating poor. The green is ideal utilization, and again, I just have a dual core laptop here. And blue says I'm oversubscribing threads to the available uh, CPU resources. And that looks like there could, that could be a problem with my application here. So I've got a lot of uh, a lot of CPU um, a lot of threads that are oversubscribed, or CPU cores that are oversubscribed. In the summary window over here, this little box shows me the overall utilization, which is um, 
to which is saying I, I only use 72 percent of the available cores, uh, so I have 6.17 seconds of the CPU time were not used. And then you can see over here I have three running or runnable threads um, that uh, were over utilizing the CPUs of for about almost four seconds. So what this is indicating to me is that the work uh, the thread, I've, I've either created too many threads or that for whatever reason the work is not getting scheduled amongst the available CPUs appropriately. And so I want to find a way to, uh, you know, to better, you know, you know, to take advantage of all the cores that I have. And so I have a number of options. I can play around a little bit with OpenMP and there's some scheduling, um, there's some scheduling clauses I can use, maybe more of a dynamic scheduling. You know, maybe try to break up the loop and um, you know more efficiently utilize the or, you know, lay out the work there. But what I'm going to do is is go ahead and take a look at a TBB implementation. Now TBB has you know, some very nice properties, especially for C++, for allowing you to um, uh, really lay out the data. Um, or let TDB lay out the data in, in manners that are much more amenable to the utilization of the cache and the CPU resources that you have. I can specify this TDB blocked range TB, which, which tells me the, the shape and the size of the iteration space over which I want the, um, you know, the work to be, uh, to be laid out. And then I can let the parallel 4 do the implementation or do the parallel implementation. I can also play around with the grain size, so that means the, the amount of work that I want scheduled amongst the TDB threads. And then here in the draw trace routine, I just created an operator out of basically a class and operator out of the, the, the routine. I could do this in a lambda as well, I just didn't have the time to do that yet. But let's go ahead and see, having done it with a TDB implementation, if that's uh, any better in terms of the performance. So I'll go ahead and fire that off. And you can see the different the tiling effect here. It's really scheduling the, um, the rendering in a much different manner. And now we're down to 6.2, 6.3 6 seconds. So you know, there we went from a 12.3 down to 6.2. Yeah, that's about a one point, almost a 1.9x speed up. And you know, that's good enough for me. I think I'll stop there. I think we've done enough for today. <laughs> um, and with that, Back over to James to wrap up here. The evaluation copies of Parallel Studio.